This is part two of my series on how to acquire talent. So in the first part, we talked about how to get A players. In this part, what I wanna talk about is how to keep A players. People are leaving because they're gonna start their own business, they wanna become an influencer online, or they wanna go work for this company that is gonna pay twice as much and they're not even gonna have to work as much. How do I keep people once I get them in? So back in 2016, when I started Gym Launch, I felt like I got a really good hang of attracting talent because like I explained in my last video, Attracting talent is just as much a sales skill as it is getting customers. What I realized was that you would come up with the same problems that you come up with with customers, which is you can be really good at sales, but that doesn't really matter in terms of growing your business if you can't keep the people that you're selling. The same goes for candidates. And the thing is, is that with candidates or employees is that it's much more costly to lose employees than it is customers. And the more often that you lose employees, the more often you're going to lose customers. And so if you're in that spot where you're like, I don't know how to keep the talent that I'm getting. I don't know how to keep them excited. I don't know if I'm even doing a good job. Once you've gotten someone in, essentially then they're in fulfillment, right? And fulfillment for an employee is really training and support. The way that I look at it, there's really three pillars to training and support. There's context, there's expectations, and there's onboarding. So when it comes to keeping talent, the one thing that will drive employees crazy is if you continue to tell them they're not doing a good job when you haven't even told them what a good job is in the first place. And so they don't know what good looks like. And so if you don't tell them what good looks like, if you just say, go make your bed, and then they go make their bed and it looks okay, but you're like, no, that's not how I want it. Make your bed again. You just get frustrated and you just yell at them. When in reality, it's like, maybe you need to be more explicit, which is like, make your bed like a five-star hotel would. It's like, ah, okay, I can visualize that. I know what that looks like. Thank you, I can understand that expectation. And a lot of times the reason that employees leave is because they feel underappreciated because bosses are constantly punishing employees for expectations that they're not meeting that they never told them. It's not meeting their expectations. And you don't wanna do that. What you would rather do is set expectations lower. When I'm on an interview process and I'm setting expectations for a job, I like to almost overemphasize how much I don't know, how much I can't help them, how much of a mess it is. And when they come in, they're like, Layla, this is not nearly as bad as you said it. There's way more in place. You've done a great job. And I'm like, oh, have I? And the reason that it's that way is because I would rather they come in and be delighted that it's not a complete shit show, right? Because they thought it might've been. Then they come in and be disappointed. Now, the second piece of this is context. Context is the why. Context is the set of circumstances that has created the job. What has happened within the company to create the need for this job? Tell them the story. Give them the context. Why do we need a customer support director? Let me tell you why. We started this company, this was our mission. Our value is timeliness. We started this team, we tried to promote this person, they're incompetent. Now we have this huge problem because we're behind on all these customer things. And so now I'm like, I think I need a customer support director. And if people have context, they have a much easier time prioritizing. So if they wanna create a more timely customer service department, what do they need to know about the company? What circumstances have created it to not be timely that they need to know about so they can create it to be timely? And then what resources are they gonna to need to know about or be aware of to help them get the job done? How do they go buy something? You know, how do they go pay for this? There's so many things that are surrounding the job. And so the question that I like to ask myself is, what circumstances does this person need to know about in order to do the job exceedingly well? And then the last piece to fulfillment is onboarding. What I want you to understand for this video in terms of fulfillment is that onboarding should be a mirror into the future of the role. Okay, so a lot of people create an onboarding program that does not align with what the role is gonna look like in the future. Let me explain. Say that this role is one where you can't train the person. You don't know what the job looks like and you won't be talking to them for the most of the time they're in the job. Maybe it's somebody else they're gonna be talking to. But you onboard them, you talk to them every day, you train them as much as you can, you're talking to them all day, every day. And then once their onboarding is up, two weeks in, you're like, see ya, here's the job, go figure it out. They're like, what the heck? Bruh. You're mismatching expectations. Onboarding should be almost like the accelerator for the job. So it should match the same conditions. Again, we're talking about conditions and expectations here. It should match the conditions that they're going to enter into when they're fully onboarded. So if they need to go and be autonomous and figure things out for themselves, that should be what you're doing in the onboarding. And then it should just continue on. So the second piece to keeping A players and keeping employees is really understanding the five pillars of retention and ascension. And here's the thing, is that ascension is part of retention. If you want to retain people, you want to ascend people. So I'll explain that later in this video. But the five pillars to essentially retention are opportunity for growth, measurable impact, fair pay, recognition, and community. And so I'm gonna break each one of these down to explain how you can retain employees with each of them. Now, what you have to understand, the average employee loss in a company is gonna cost you 1.5 to two times their annual salary. 
So if you bring someone in and then within two months, they're not the right fit and you were paying them $70,000 a year, you most likely are losing $100,000. When we go into retention, I want you to understand that I'm taking this from a point of view of ownership, which is we have to own the reason that we churn employees. And yes, there is good churn in certain roles, but most churn, it's not good churn. It's just being irresponsible. And so a lot of people look at it and they're like, people just aren't cut out for this job. It's like, well, then why wouldn't you figure that out in the interview process? Why'd you gotta figure that out after you offer them the job after they quit the other job they had? There's no reason for that. And so to save you a bad reputation and to save them from making a huge life change, just put these things in place. The first piece of retaining an employee is having an employee growth plan. And listen, I used to not have these in place because I'd be like, dude, how am I gonna put a growth plan in place when I don't even know we're gonna be in six months or a year? I didn't even think the business would survive this long. I know a lot of people feel that way. You're like, I got lucky and now it's working and like now I don't know what to do. The thing is, is that if an employee doesn't have a clear path for growth, they don't have a vision of how they're gonna fit into the company. And what you want is you want a vision so big for your company that they can fit their personal vision inside of that vision. And so what you wanna do is you wanna make that real for them. An employee growth plan really just has a few parts to it. Broken down, first you've got a clear path which is when you bring someone in, you wanna be painting the picture of where you see them ending up. So if I bring someone in and say they're just a customer success manager and they're working hand-to-hand -hand combat with clients, but they have a lot of experience in their background, I might paint the picture that I eventually one day want them to be VP of customer success. And then every time we're talking, what we're aiming towards is where I'm always talking in context with the goal. I'm like, well, if you're gonna be VP of customer success one day, then this is what we've got to do now to get there. Here's what we should do this quarter to get you there. Here's what the team should look like to get you there. And I'm constantly talking about what it needs to look like to get them there to that goal. So it's setting that clear path and it's reinforcing that path. Now, the second piece of that is training. And a lot of people say, they're like, Layla, I don't know what a VP of customer success is. How am I supposed to train them on being a VP of customer success? You don't need to train them. You're just responsible for facilitating the training. So if you don't know what it looks like, that's fine. You are responsible for acquiring the resources to train them which means maybe that means you pay for a seminar or you pay for a workshop or you pay for some kind of certification they're gonna get. There's other people that can train them. You're just responsible for facilitating the training. The third piece from that is feedback because as this person's learning and training, you wanna know what does good look like? Like we talked about the expectations, what does good look like? They're taking the training and they're taking everything they're learning and they're putting it into the job. And now you wanna give them feedback because when people are doing things that are new and they're trying to acquire more skills, they're gonna go and they're gonna swing on what I call like the pendulum of death, which is anytime you try something new, you go extreme one way, extreme the other way, and eventually end up in the middle. And so you need to be there when they're on the pendulum of death to tell them, hey, you're on the extreme. You're all the way towards like, I only love employees and I fuck everything else and fuck every other department. A lot of people go that way. They're gonna be like, I'm learning how to be a leader. And all they do is value the employee. They overpay them, they overbaby them, they overcompensate them. And then you're gonna tell them that and they're gonna go the other way on the pendulum of death. And they're gonna say, fuck employees, it's always their fault. They suck not paying them anything, paying them very little, all this stuff, right? And you're gonna say, listen, man, that's not the right idea either. And they're coming to the middle where they're like, I should pay people fairly. I should treat them well. I should take ownership, but they should take ownership too, right? They're being reasonable. And so you wanna be there to tell them when they're on that pendulum of death, learning new skills, where do they fall? Because when they're in that training session, they're always gonna lean one way or the other. And you just wanna be there to tell them which way they're leaning and what way they need to lean in order to get higher in the company and follow that career path. The fourth piece to career expansion is opportunity. And so if you wanna create opportunities for that person, it's basically what I would call like stretch goals. A stretch goal is when you give someone a task that is above their current job, but you believe they can achieve. It's a reasonable that they can acquire. Like they have an 80% chance of being able to succeed in this task. That's what I would call a stretch goal. And so when you're putting this person on this career path, in order to ascend into that VP of customer success, I might say, okay, cool. Say I'm out of town for two weeks. I'm gonna say, hey, I want you to play VP of customer success for those two weeks that I'm gone. I drafted a job description of what that would look like. And I want you to do these five things over the next two weeks while I'm gone. And I wanna see how it goes and I'll come back. And it's low risk to you because like how much could someone possibly mess up in two weeks? If you're giving this to them, you're believing that they have an 80% likelihood they're gonna succeed. And the last part of the career path is really expansion, which is then that's finally giving them the clear path to how they're gonna get that VP of customer success and then letting them expand into it, which is usually saying, here's how you get promoted. Here's how you get a pay raise. It's very clear, it's laid out. So it's like, if you want this promotion, you need to do these three things. The second practice in retaining talent is measurable impact. 
And so people want to stay in organizations where they have an impact on the organization. If you look, the second top reason that people leave is they don't feel that their work is impactful. And so how do you create the feeling of impact in a company? Because the reality is, is that most people have an impact in a company, but they just don't know that because employers don't understand how to demonstrate the impact to them. And so let's talk about how to demonstrate measurable impact to people. Impact is always had in any organization. There's an action and then there's the results of it, right? So what we want to do is we want to close the gap between action and impact. So here's what that looks like. I have an acronym, which is impact. I stands for illustrate the meaning. Okay, so what that means is that when someone comes in, you're explaining to them the meaning behind the job. So if you've seen Simon Sinek's demonstration of why, what you want to explain to them is why have the role. Why does this role exist? You want to illustrate the meaning of that to them. And that's why I start with telling them what problem are you solving? Because typically that relates back to the why. And so it's always illustrating to someone the meaning of the job on the job description itself, in team meetings, on their quarterly reviews, on their one-on-ones, telling them why the role is so important. The second piece is the M, which is you're going to measure all outcomes. This is why KPIs are so important. You're literally showing them the impact the role has on an organization. People think that employees don't like KPIs. Employees love KPIs if you're measuring the right things that show the impact they're having on the organization. If you could show a department, say finance, how much money they've saved the company that month, that quarter, and say they get a percent of that money. Imagine how impactful that is for them. They're like, holy crap, I'm saving the company this much money by doing my job. That's cool. Same with a customer success department. You're like, we've increased the revenue that our customers bring in through their companies by X percent this quarter. They're like, that's so cool. We've helped companies make that much more money. For our company, Prestige Labs, we used to always show the people like, this is how much we've made in commissions. So to date, Prestige Labs has made $16 million in commissions for gym owners. That's money that we don't take. That's money that we've made that. Imagine how proud our team feels knowing that they've made people $16 million. That's crazy. It's measuring the outcome of the meaning. The third is P, which is you're going to present results constantly. Okay, so people say, how do I present the results constantly? It's like, I'm showing you the KPI, you understand the why, blah, 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 right? Typically, the best way to present results is to share stories. So it's sharing stories on your team meetings, on your huddles of client wins, of the results driven. It's always sharing stories. And so when I say presenting all the results constantly, I mean sharing stories constantly. Hey, did you see what happened over here with this client the other day? Hey, did you see what the finance department did that just saved our sale the other day? Hey, and it's just constantly sharing the stories. And the best way to do that is to do it on company huddles and company meetings. The A or the fourth piece to it is acknowledge the person of cause. So a lot of times when you're sharing all these things, you're kind of talking vaguely. But what you want is you want to actually call people out. And so a great way that you can do this in terms of calling people out is you can just do shout outs. So a great way to do that is like on a Slack channel, for example, have a shout out section. She's like, hashtag shout out. It's just like, anytime someone does something good, shout them out on that channel. It's super simple. The next piece is C, which is cheer them on. And so this one is really encouraging people. Okay, so when you look at encouragement, it's basically encouragement and recognition, which is cheering them on, giving them positive reinforcement for doing the thing. And so if you look at it, it's like a feedback cycle, a huge piece of that is positive reinforcement. So it's how are you gonna positively reinforce the impact this person's having on the organization? And it's usually just positive encouragement. And the best person they could hear that from is their boss. The last piece of impact, and arguably the most important, is T, which is tie it back to the mission. Okay, so a company that does this extremely well, and almost all of them do, are all nonprofits. You know what they say when you buy the Girl Scout cookies? They tell you how much money from buying the Girl Scout cookies is gonna go towards this cause that's gonna save this many children. It's the same with something like Underground Railroads. You're like, if you donate X amount of money, you save X amount of children from human trafficking. If you can do that within your company, then imagine the impact people feel when they're doing their work. That's why so many people go and they love working for nonprofits because they feel the impact. You have the same elements of a nonprofit. You just make profits. So you can figure out the impact just as easily. You just need to take the time to sit down and think it through. So after impact, the third practice in terms of retaining people is fair pay. And this is a super controversial topic. And listen, I've tried all different ways of paying people and I have come to the, the learning that paying people fairly and paying people as much as you can for the most part, or what I would say is not as much as you can, but top of the market is the best way to retain people. And so a lot of people argue with me for this. A lot of studies have been done on this. 
less higher paid employees produce more than more lower paid employees. Okay, so this stemmed from Henry Ford. Henry Ford actually called this one of his best cost cutting moves when he doubled the wages of all of his workers. And he actually increased the productivity and the revenue of the company and the profit of the company. If it, you have a customer who pays you 10 times as much as all the other customers, do you pay them more attention? Do you do more for them? You're thinking, yes. Wouldn't you do more for an employer who paid you more than everybody else? It's a reciprocity factor. And here's the other thing, is that the opportunity cost or the loss that you have if you leave is much greater than if you were to leave somewhere that doesn't pay well. So if you look at opportunity costs, they're like, oh, I could leave and go do this over here. And then you're like, shit, but nowhere else is really gonna pay me this well. Like it would take me all this work to make as much money as I make here. The fourth piece to retaining employees is recognition. And guys, I have a whole video on recognition. And so you can go watch it here. But recognition, there's really four ways that you can recognize people. There's outcome, effort, milestone, and value. Okay, and so what I mean by that is value-based recognition would be that you're recognizing people when they act upon the values of the company. Outcome-based recognition is that when you recognize people for hitting outcomes that are expected from their role. Effort-based recognition is recognizing the hard work or the effort someone is putting in towards getting an initiative done. And then milestone-based is basically recognizing the progress someone has made towards completing a project. And so if you don't feel like you're recognizing employees at all right now, here's my suggestion. Take one of those and start saying every time someone exemplifies this core value, or every time someone completes a third of this project, or every time someone gets this specific outcome, I'm gonna recognize them. And start with one, because here's where people go wrong. They hear me say this and they say, I'm gonna go try and do all of it. It's like, dude, I can't even do all of it, okay? That's ideal, but that's not real life. And so just try to do one. And I think the easiest one to start with is anytime you see someone exemplify a certain core value, pick one of your core values, go recognize those people. The last piece to employee retention is community. And here's what's really easy. If you can create community within a client base, you can create community within an employee base. A lot of people don't get this. If you've seen this formula, uh, Russell Brunson has, it's creating a mass movement, okay? There's three aspects to it. There's the charismatic leader, there's the cause or the culture, and there's a new opportunity or the vehicle of change. Okay, so let me explain to you how I have those in my company. So charismatic leader is myself and Alex, right? We're the charismatic leaders of acquisition.com. Then there's the culture. If you guys hear us talk about it, it's like sincere candor, competitive greatness, unimpeachable character. We hammer those home and we use those all the time in our company. And people are hearing us constantly saying those things because we're also out there putting all this content out. It's not just for the outside, it's not just for people like looking into our company, it's for also the people that we want to work in our company. So the culture is stemming from our messaging. The message is that we wanna document and share the best practices of building a world-class business. And then we paint the picture for what that's gonna look like. What's our cause, what's our reasoning? Well, one day we wanna create a school for entrepreneurship. One day we want to be able to help people who are 17, 16 to 20. We want to be able to put all of our extra funds towards that and create something really free from all the, essentially what I call sawdust, from all the wood we've been sawing within the company, create sawdust, which is all the extra leftovers, which is like, we have all this content, we have all these trainings, we have all these people. We could create something pretty easily over here for people who are really young to figure out what they want to do with their life. It's not college. So that's our cause. And then the third piece to it is what's our new vehicle? The value acceleration capital method, right? Which is what we call VAM. And so that is our unique vehicle because we say, hey, we're not P, we're not management consulting, we're not a mastermind, we're also not VC. What are we? We're like, we're VAM. We're this new thing that, guess what? We made it up. But it's a new vehicle for how we're gonna accomplish our goals. And so if you're trying to think, how do I create a community for people? Community is created by having those three aspects. A company where every person has one friend in the organization have 12% more profits than companies who don't. It's crazy. That in itself is how you retain employees. And so if you look at it holistically, it sounds like a lot, I know. If I were you, what I would do is I would look at the five things that I've just mentioned, and I would pick one to start with. And I would pick one of the five things in that one to start with. And you just take one step. If you could just do one thing every quarter, two to three years from now, you're gonna have like churn busted machine. <laughs> that was a lame word, but it is what it is. You're gonna have a company that nobody wants to leave. Okay, so it's just one step at a time. Don't overwhelm yourself. So overall, if you want to keep people on your team, it's really these two things, right? It's fulfilling on your promises, and then it's retention, which creates ascension, right? Ascension is part of retention. 
And so that is how you keep eight players on your team. I'm going to make a couple more videos that I think I wanna make on more tactically. So I'd love to hear in the comments, like what are the tactics in terms of retention that were a little unclear or I could go extrapolate out a little more. Would love to hear that in the comments. And again, if you haven't seen part one in terms of how to get eight players, go ahead and watch that video. It's linked here and let me know what you thought.